Thank you very much. Um, really, I traveled quite a long way uh, from uh, Beijing to uh, tell you two things. Um, this is obviously the first year of economic reform. We just saw the whole package of reform putting together by the new government um, in uh, November last year. But everything um, is just about to start. So we're going to see lots of uncertainties. And there are lots of tests um, facing the government, both in terms of whether they will be um, decisive enough in pushing ahead with all the reforms. And at the same time, you push ahead with the reform uh, without uh, um, triggering uh, uh, any systemic risks or crisis. These are the two things that are very hard to balance for the policymakers. I'm sure it's a tough um, choice for all governments. But the second thing I'd like to say, if we do see um, implementation of um, a large part of the program um, announced in November last year, we are about to see a major transformation of the Chinese economy, which we have been talking about for quite a while. Um, that could in involve lots of things um, happening in the next decade or two. Um, slowing growth, um, rising inflation, um, improving income distribution, um, uh, probably more balanced economic structure, accelerated uh, industrial upgrading, and uh, probably more dramatic economic cycles. So, in fact, in uh, five to ten years, we may see a Chinese economy which will be very, very different from what it, it is today or what, what was used, used to be um, the case. Um, if I can get that work. Um, but um, what has been transforming the Chinese economy um, is, is probably just beyond what I just mentioned about uh, um, the economic reforms. There are three sets of factors affecting the economy simultaneously, and these would uh, contribute to um, change um, in, uh, in, in, in the economy. Number one, we have technological factors like uh, um, the new energy. Um, shale gas in the U.S. is having a big impact on China already, and China is stepping up its efforts in, uh, in uh, developing its own shale gas. But mo more importantly, at the, at the time, what we're seeing now is the Internet is revolutionized many, many parts of the economy. We already know um, the um, e-commerce accounts for 7% of the total retail sales. It's actually al almost eliminated all the physical bookstores in the country. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, um, e-finance is becoming a new force um, in, a, in a, the financial industry. So lots of things actually change, changing because of the technological factors. The second factor is also change, uh, important. is related to the market conditions. Um, so we are expecting some improvement in uh, um, external market, which, which probably means export sector would do somewhat better this year than before. Um, however, um, we think the overall picture in terms of the export for the Chinese export is now become a lot more constrained compared to um, the last three decades. This is because even if the global economy is recovering, we are expecting a much slower trend growth for the global economy. This is also because um, you look at the economic structure within China, uh, it's changing very quickly. What it used to do well uh, may, not, may no longer be the case. So even if the global economy, particularly the US economy, recovers this year, if it's led by consumption, it will be a good story for China. If it's led by investment, the story probably will still be good, but it will be less good for the Chinese export sector. But most importantly, um, China is now a large country in the global market. And as you probably heard, um, whatever China buys, it becomes expensive. And what, whatever China sells, it becomes cheap. Um, and that is the reason why growth of Chinese export becomes a lot more constrained than before. We used to experience 30% export growth every year, almost for 30 years. It would no longer be possible. Simply think about uh, um, international politics. There's another factor which is also very important domestically in terms of um, the market condition. 
That is the so-called Lewis turning point. The labor market has already shifted from surplus to shortage. And we are seeing wages rising very dramatically, probably by 15 to 20 percent for seven, eight years now. And that is transforming the Chinese industry in a very significant way. The most important factor, obviously, the last factor is um, the institutional um, change. Um, last year, there, was lots of, there were lots of discussions in uh, um, Chinese and international media about a new economic policy framework of the new government. The key reason why this became such a big topic was because um, most people realized that the old system, old model of growth was no longer sustainable. And the new leaders kept talking about the need to change the growth model and implement all the reforms. But until November, we didn't really see a comprehensive package. And this is why there were lots of different versions of the so-called economics in the media, in the market, and even in China, lots of discussions. But anyway, now we have seen the full script of, um, of, the, of, the, of the package in uh, um, November, the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress. It contains 60 points um, altogether. It's a very cons comprehensive package, and I would have to say most of the Chinese economists and even many policymakers were quite impressed when the package was released, and it probably went further um, than most people expected. But if you look at uh, um, the, the whole package, the package as a whole, three key features stand out compared to the previous reforms we used to implement. Number one is the so-called top-level uh, authority. The Chinese reform was, is, was often described as a bottom-up approach. So for instance, the farming and household responsibility system in agriculture, it was essentially experimented by farmers themselves, and the government simply adopted it as a national policy since it, it worked. Uh, but now it's no longer possible. The so-called crossing the river by touching the stones is no longer a viable option because there's no longer stones to be touched, especially if you think about interest rate liberalization, capital account liberalization. You do need top-level design, systemic de design, in order to put together a workable uh, plan. The second very important reason why we need a top-level decision now, which is obviously a departure from our previous reform approach, is that you need a top-level authority in order to overcome the domestic resistance to um, the reforms. So one very good example was in 2006, the State Council uh, published a, a document, a policy document, called 36 Articles. The purpose of the document was to encourage private capital entering the monopoly industry. Five years um, later, there was no progress, and so the State Council announced another policy called the New 36 Articles, again to encourage the private capital entering the monopoly industry. Again, there was little progress, and the State Council is still working on it. There are obviously lots of different explanations of why that was the case, but one reason um, was probably because the vast interest groups were so strong, even the government was not strong enough to overcome um, them. So this is why the very high level, the so-called leading group of uh, cons comprehensive reform, um, it is it, headed by the president, and assisted by um, a group of most senior officials, both from the party and from the government. Hopefully, that would change um, the way um, implement uh, the, the reforms are implemented. The second uh, key feature of the new reform program is the so-called uh, complete market, uh, completing the market reform. China has been implementing market-oriented reforms for 35 years, but it still is an uncompleted project. Um, and one of the ways I would look at is you look at the product market from agriculture, manufacturing, and the service sector, they're almost completely liberalized. But you look at the input markets, the markets for labor, for capital, for land, for energy, for water, and so on, they remain heavily distorted. And in most cases, the costs have been um, depressed. 
which means for 35 years we have been subsidizing implicitly the corporate sector by taxing the Chinese household. This was one reason, I think, why we saw a very unique growth model in China. On the one hand, the growth has been very strong. That's why people call it economic miracle. At the same time, you saw all the structural problems. Um, like imbalance problems, inequality problems, pollution problems, and so on. That's why our former Premier Wen Jiabao once said this, this growth model is uncoordinated, imbalanced, inefficient, and therefore unsustainable. So what we need to do now is to complete the transition to the market system within the next seven years, because 2020 is the year we want to achieve uh, breakthroughs in, term of, in terms of the reforms. The last key feature is more about uh, um, justice and equity over, over, overruling um, efficiency and, and the development. So in the past, all the reform policies would end up focusing on growth, on economic development. This time, there are more discussions about the need to tolerate slow growth in order to uh, push ahead with the structural reform. So I think this is actually a very different uh, um, approach. Now, as, as I explained, um, this is the reason why the next uh, six, seven years, we're going to see major breakthroughs. But the key areas we are going to see changes more are the, uh, the, 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 the removal of the remaining distortions, the remaining interventions by the state in the economy. And I would focus a lot more on the soft budget constraint of the state sector, of the local government investment vehicles, and even some financial institutions. At the same time, looking at liberalizing the markets for labor, for capital, for land, for energy, for, um, for, for, for water, um, and so on. This would be the key um, to uh, push the economy through, um, through the transformation toward a new growth model. If you look at the Chinese economy today, uh, my own sense is transition has already started. The growth model is already changing. Now, the, as I said, there are two ways um, looking at the Chinese growth model, very, very distinctive features. On the one hand, the growth has been very strong. On the other hand, the imbalance problems became more and more serious. If you look at what the, um, our former Premier Wen Jiabao once listed, the problems in the economy, too much investment, too little consumption, too much reliance on the export sector, pollution problem, corruption problem, and so on. Um, however, if you look at the economy today, um, we, are, we start to see some change, um, emergence of the new growth model. First, um, the growth is slowing already. Um, this year, for instance, most many economists are debating whether we should set the new growth, the, the annual growth target at 7% or 7.5%. The reason is obviously um, there's a, the growth is decelerating. While people are still heatedly debating, one thing has already changed. That is, nobody now still worry about the below 8% GDP growth would mean disaster for China. That was a very strong view held by many people for decades. But that is already no longer the case. So you look at uh, um, think tanks' uh, estimates of the new growth potentials. They normally range between 6 to 7 to 8 percent. The optimistic estimate is 8 percent, and the relatively less optimistic estimate is around 6 percent. Um, but in January, they all agree that the days of 10 percent growth is over. The reason why we are more comfortable with the slower growth today is number one because we saw all the negative consequences from the government's uh, support, strong support to growth. When you needed to maintain very strong growth by increasing government uh, um, investment, that can be done, that can still be done if the government uh, wishes to do so. But you see lots of conflict, uh, consequences like overcapacity, inflation, asset bubble, uh, fiscal risks, and financial risks, and so on. So actually, I think the policymakers reached a new consensus that we should allow growth to slope. 
The second reason why they're comfortable with slower growth is that in the past, whenever we thought 8% growth was necessary, because we worried about employment. And in 1998, when the first the 8% uh, magical number was raised, that was the time when our labor force was rising by 8 million people every year. And uh, you needed something like uh, 12 million um, new jobs every year. That's why um, the government thought we needed to maintain 8% growth in order to maintain full employment, maintain social stability. Today, the workforce is already declining by 3 million every year, and we probably need new jobs of about 2 million. If that was a comparable number, then we probably need comparable growth way below 7% to maintain full employment and to maintain social, uh, uh, social stability. Structure changes are also happening, and we all know that China's current account surplus already shrank from uh, the peak of around 11% of GDP in 2007, and it remained at below 3% the last couple of years. Income distribution is also improving. Income distribution is also improving last few years, but uh, so far the changes were mainly driven by um, the changes in the labor market. As I mentioned, we, we already saw the Louis turning point. The labor market is already seeing shortage problems. That's why when growth slowed last couple of years, we didn't see unemployment pro new unemployment problem. We still saw labor shortage and the wages were still rising very quickly. Wage increase had a big impact on the Chinese growth model. Number one, when, you, when wages rise, it cuts into the profit margins of production, reduces the investment returns, and probably also hurts export competitiveness. That's why growth is slowing. But at the same time, it actually is, is very positive for income distribution because poor, low income households rely on wages, while, while high income households depend more on investment returns. So when wage rises very quickly, it's kind of income redistribution from the rich people to the poor people. This is, again, the reason why we also start to see consumption to rise again. So important changes are already happening in the Chinese economy, but this is obviously mainly driven by changes in the labor market condition, not by the policy. So this is why implementation of the, the comprehensive reform package approved, but approved by the third plenum would be very critical. Um, everybody is waiting for uh, breakthroughs in the reforms. My own view is uh, I think the most significant component of the reform, um, the whole entire package, is in the financial reform. The financial reform is critical because, number one, as China moves toward a market system, we know finance will have to play a critical role in uh, establishing the new market economy in China. Without an efficient financial system, we, we, don't even, you, we, we cannot think of a, a well-developed market system. Second, of all the distortions I mentioned in the factor markets, financial distortion was by far the most serious um, distortions in the economy. So in order to correct, correct all the distortions in economic structure, we needed to liberalize the financial system. But the third, as you probably all would all agree, that financial liberalization is also quite sensitive. Um, there are lots of experiences in the emerging world. Um, financial liberalization leads to significant rise of systemic risks. But this is why we have to watch the financial reforms very closely. And this is the key reason why I think this year we see lots of tests for the policymakers. I mean, the overall, the baselines, if you look at the market forecast, they are expecting GDP growth at between 6.7.6 to 7.7% for this year, C CPI around 3%. But we may actually see downside risks to growth this year because all the factors we're talking about when the government tightened the controls over local government borrowing, 
when the government start to tighten the liquidity conditions and trying to deleverage in the financial system and so on. All these would point to downside risks to growth. But most importantly, we, are, we, we, we expect the Chinese economy to transit from the previous economic miracle to more normal development. Um, what I mean by normal development is really China would become um, another emerging market economy or maybe rapidly growing emerging market economy. And during that process, we'll see lots of changes uh, within the economy. And I normally would focus on um, six areas. GDP growth is going to slow and will grow slow further. Inflation pressure will continue to rise, partly because of broad-based and sustained um, increase in factor costs. Um, income distribution will probably improve, not just because of the wage increase, but also because of the interest rate liberalization and the government's income distribution policy. Economic structure is going to become more balanced. In the past, we relied a lot on investment and on exports to drive growth. I think going forward, we're going to see consumption as a major driver of Chinese growth. And we already start to see consumption as a share of GDP is rising very quickly. In the past, we used to, whenever we talk about the Chinese consumer, we only think about the luxury goods, and that still is probably the case. But we, we're likely to see, I think, more significantly in the coming years is the average household income increase would lead to significant consumption up upgrade, and that would have a big impact on the global economy as well. Accelerate the industrial upgrading because of, uh, the, the, the cost will rise significantly. Whatever we do well now, may no longer be the industries we still have a competitive in the coming years. And that's why if you travel to China today, you are seeing very dramatic changes in the industrial landscape. And many of the industries are finding difficulties um, today. But many of the new industries are emerging um, also. Finally, um, the government used to support economic growth to restrict the range of the GDP growth numbers within a very narrow range. That is going to change. As we move toward a market system, we're going to see more normal economic cycles. That obviously would mean positive stories when China expands, but it could also mean um, negative stories for, um, for not only China, but also the rest of the world. But, but that's a natural part of um, economic cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you.